So if you're one of those people who are looking all around you and everybody's using Docker, but you're not really sure what it is or what role it fills, well, don't worry, you're not alone. Docker is gaining huge traction and it's being adopted very widely and very fast. So first, what is Docker? Docker itself is kind of this larger tool set that contains the tools necessary to build images that contain various software, and then of course to launch containers, which are instances of those images. One important attribute of a Docker image is that a Docker image is built to do one very specific thing. So for instance, there's a Docker image for Python 3, and all that's in that image is just Python 3, and possibly pip. There's also a Docker image for, say, Redis, which just contains Redis and nothing else. And then there's a Docker image for MySQL, which just contains MySQL, and you, you can kind of see the pattern here. There's two ways Docker images come to be. The first way is that you can get Docker images directly from the Docker repository itself. What happens is different vendors like Redis and Node.js, they'll publish these images to the Docker repository so you can pull them down to your machine and use them in, in your environment. The second way is you can build your own image. And what you do is you take an official image from the Docker repository and then you can extend that to do other things. And we'll briefly touch on later an example of building your own image according to your specifications. So images themselves, they, they don't do anything. Like an image is not, a, it's not running. Uh, when you want to run an image, that's when it becomes a container. What containers are is they're Docker images with some specific configuration applied to those images. When I'm talking about configuration, there's a litany of different configuration options, but primarily what we're going to talk about today is things like exposed ports, and inter-container networking, and then volumes. At this point in the video, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how does this differ from just like a virtual machine that you would run in, say, VirtualBox or VMware? And the answer to that is they are similar to virtual machines, but they have a couple very, very key differences. The first difference is that a container starts and stops very fast and with much less space and much less memory usage because images are often highly stripped down versions of like a Linux operating system plus the software that's necessary. So it keeps out a lot of the fluff from the container. The second difference is Docker containers are not designed to just be turned on and connected to. Like you're not supposed to start a container and then go interact with that container. That's not really what they're for. Docker containers are designed to start, and then once they're started, they're designed to run one command at start, and then as soon as that command finishes running, it tears down that container. So at this point, I think it's helpful to jump into some examples. So we're going to do a total of four examples here. The first example is we're going to use Docker, specifically an image containing Python 3, to run a Python file. And we have our file here. It's very simple. It's just print hello, nothing crazy. The command that we're interested in right now is going to be docker run, and that's a command that's used to basically start an instance of an image. Also, we call this a container, so start a container. So docker run is in the format of docker run, and then specify options, and then specify the image name, and then specify the command to run in that container. So first, by specifying dash dash rm, we're saying once the container shuts down to just remove that container. This next option here is a very important one. It's dash V and it's for volume. And the reason we need volumes is because the container does not have access to the actual host machine. So when I start a Python 3 container, all it has access to is what was present in that image. But we need it to run a file that's on the host. So to do this, we can basically mount host folders on a folder in the container. So what this basically says is mount the current working directory onto slash source of the container. And this next option is going to be the image name. It's going to be Python is the image, and then three is going to be the tag. And then finally, the last part is the actual command to run. And this is going to be what command to run in the container. So to recap, Docker run is going to start a container. It's going to mount the current working directory to slash src. It's going to start the container with Python 3, and then it's going to run Python slash src slash hello.py in the container. So let's actually do this to see what happens. When we run this command, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to say it can't find the image locally. So what it's doing right now is it's reaching out to the Docker repository to download everything it needs to do. 
Keep in mind that it only needs to go through that process once because once it has the Python 3 image locally, it could just start the container directly from that instantly. And you can see here, once it got everything built and it started the container, it printed out hello, which was the result of that one file. We can see now that if we run the same thing again, it just prints out hello instantly. It doesn't have to re-go through everything. Now I just want to show you what would happen real quick if I remove the volume. Basically now the container cannot see the file it needs to execute. So when I go to execute it, you can see it says cannot open file slash src slash hello.py. And that's because it's looking for a file that doesn't exist because we did not mount it. This is why volumes are so important and such a key part of making Docker containers work for you. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to start an actual Python interpreter from the Docker container. So we have our second command here, which is basically identical to our first command, except we've added this dash IT. And this allows us to make it interactive, meaning that we're going to do something in the container. And then rather than doing python slash src slash hello.py, we're simply doing python. And then, see normally in a host, if you write python and hit enter, you get the python interpreter. So in this case, when we run this, you'll see that we get a Python interpreter. Now this is a Python interpreter that is being ran in the Docker container itself. And just like that last command, if you wanted to, instead of run Python, you can also just run bash. And what this allows you to do is actually look at what the running container looks like right after it starts. So if we run this, you can see that we get a new, get a new prompt here. And, and remember how I said that it mounted the current working directory to slash src? Well, if we cd to slash src and we do an ls-l, we can see our hello.py here. And that, remember, we're in the container right now. Root at and this hash is going to be the container ID. It's also worth noting that if we run something like top inside the container, you can see that it's just, it's just two things. It's just top and then it's just bash that was ran when it started. You, you notice that you can't see all the other stuff on the computer. Okay, now we're going to move on to an example where Say you need Python 3, but you also need something like NumPy. So of course you can look for a pre-built you can look for a pre-built image already. Maybe you can find one that has Python 3 that has NumPy, but if not, you could just build your own. And this is where we introduce this thing called the Docker file. And the purpose of the Docker file is to describe how an image is built and what is contained in it. So remember in the first example, we used the image called Python colon 3, which is the image Python with the tag 3. And then this is one real true power of Docker is that you can extend from an existing image and add your own stuff. So what we're doing here is we're saying from Python colon 3, so it says use Python 3 as our base image. And then what we can do is we can run different things that will change that image. So in this case we're saying run pip3 install numpy. So what the resulting thing here is we have an image that is Python 3 plus numpy. So to build this image, we're introducing a new command here. It's going to be docker build. And for an option here, we're using dash t, and this sets the tag. So we're saying this should be python underscore numpy. And then we're supplying a dot, which just says build the current directory, which will just look for a docker file in that directory. So if we run this command over in our terminal, we can see that it says from Python 3, run pip3 install numpy, and you can see it's actually running numpy in that image. And the same output that you see here is the same output that you would see if you're on just a normal virtual machine or your own computer running pip install numpy. And essentially what this is doing is it's starting a container of Python 3. It's running pip3 install numpy, and then it's taking an image of that container, and then it's getting rid of the container. That, that's what Docker will do internally. This is also a good time to introduce a couple key commands with Docker that lets you kind of inspect what images you have. So you can simply do docker image ls. And you can see that we have, we have two images here. One is our python3, and then we have our python underscore numpy tag latest. So what's cool now is just like we ran our script before with python3, instead we can replace it with python underscore numpy. So let's go ahead and do that. So these last three scripts, and we don't need to run all of them, these are exactly the same as the previous three that we had in the original Python example, except instead of Python colon three, we replace it with Python underscore numpy. Other than that, nothing has changed. They're all exactly the same. So if we want to run that hello.py, we can copy this over here. 
and this uses the python underscore numpy image to start a container with and run that script. And then our output is hello. Okay, so we're moving on to our third example now. The first two examples were useful to show kind of the workings of images and containers, but it's not a great example on what you might use it for in practice. So here's one great example of something you might use in practice. So imagine you have just a static website and you want to serve it and you want to use an Nginx Docker container to do so. And these commands should start looking pretty familiar now. So we're using docker run, you already know what that means, dash dash rm, we used that before, that will just remove the container once it stops. And then we're mounting a volume here. We're mounting the current working directory to slash user slash share slash nginx slash html. Now when the vendor publishes their container, they'll publish documentation with it. And in the case of nginx, they will tell you that by default, nginx will serve content located at slash user slash share slash nginx slash html. So to get a really quick container up and running, you can just mount the files you want to serve on top of that directory. And then here's a new option that we haven't seen yet, dash p. This is for ports. And what this says is take the host's port 8080 and forward it to the container's port 80. Now remember, containers and hosts, they don't clash. So you can run something on port 80 in a container, and you can run something on port 80 on your host as well. And then for the image name, we specify the image as nginx, and the tag is going to be latest, which just gives you the latest nginx. This is also going to be the first time that we start a container that's not going to immediately exit. Because remember, Nginx, once we start up Nginx, it needs to stay running. And it's going to stay running until, well, until you, until you stop it from running. So let's run this and see what happens. So just like last time, it can't find Nginx latest locally. So it needs to go out to Docker and download everything from there. Now once that's running, you can go to your browser and you can type in you know, in your case, you can do 127.0.0.1 colon 8080, and it should open the index.hello, sorry, index.html. And all this logging you're seeing in the background, the reason that's there is because we have the container running in the foreground. So it's logging everything out to the current terminal. There is a way to start it in the background. So we can clear all this out, come back over here, and then we'll start it again, except we're going to add this dash D. And that's the only difference from the first one to the second one is that we're doing a dash D, which says start it as a daemon in the background. So when we run this, you can see that it just starts and then it just exit, exits like that. You can, you can check to see which containers are running by doing docker container ls. Now this is not very neat because my text is really large so all of you can see it, but the important thing here is that the container ID is here and then the image and then the startup command, it says when it was created, it says its status, you know, up 18 seconds. And then it says the ports. So this is saying the host 8080 should point to the containers 80. And then this is the name of the container. It's just uh, some arbitrary name that Docker picks for it. If you want to stop a running container, you simply do Docker stop and then just specify the container name. And then that will just stop it. So now there's no containers running. Next thing you could do here is if you wanted to customize the nginx configuration file, you could use dash v to mount a separate configuration file on top of the one in the container. That would be the way to adjust the configuration. If you didn't want to add the configuration at docker runtime, what you could do is you could create a docker file and then you could put that file into the image. Either one's fine, just depends on your use case. The last thing I want to show here is how to log into a running container. So if you have a container start in the background, so I'm just going to start this back up, and then I'm going to do docker container ls to see it, so relaxed, grider. So if you want to log into this container, you can do docker exec, and then you can do dash it for interactive, and then at this point you specify the name of the container, and then you specify what you want to run in the container. So if you want a if you want a shell, you could just do bin bash. And then when you run it, you can see that you get a terminal here. At this point, you're now operating in the container. So you can see the various things in the container. You could go to Etsy Nginx if you wanted to check out the Nginx configuration file, or if you wanted to access access logs or whatever you need to do. Everything you're doing here is in the container. And if you do top. Of course, top's not present here. Actually, this is a good example is that not all containers are designed to be used like this. So 
the the people that built the nginx container basically said well we don't need top you know top's not relevant to serving a web page so uh, you know different images vary and they contain different software but they always err on the side of keeping the image as small as possible because that allows it to be started quicker and distributed easier so up until now we've only talked about single docker containers doing a single thing but what happens when you have a certain a use case that requires multiple containers. Like imagine a typical web application. Any web application is most likely going to have a web server like Nginx. It's going to have a backend programming language like say Node.js. It's going to have a database like MySQL or Postgres. And then it's probably going to have some sort of some sort of caching system or place to store sessions such as memcache or Redis. So what happens when you have all four of these containers ready to rock and then how do they communicate between one another? So here is yet another powerful feature of Docker, which is the Docker networks. So not only will a Docker network isolate the two containers from the rest of the network, the other thing it will do is it'll set up DNS entries between the two containers so they can talk to each other according to the container name. Pretty cool, right? So to demonstrate this, we're going to create two containers. The first container is going to be a MySQL 5.6 container. And then the second container is going to be a Node.js 8 container, which we're just going to start a terminal in. So we'll start by creating the network which these two containers are going to share. And that's as simple as doing docker network, create, and then multiple is going to be just the name of the network. And you can put whatever here. You can put any name you wanted. So we'll copy that. We'll run it over here. And you can see it has this hash which is the hash of the network. And then we can check it by doing docker network ls. And we can see that our network exists here. So now that we have our network, we're going to create our first container. Now here we have a couple of new options. We have dash dash net. This allows us to say, make this container use the network that's named multiple. And then dash dash name, mole underscore MySQL. Remember that random generated container name that Docker gave it? Well, by using dash dash name, you can have it have a specific name. That way you can reference it later. And in this environment variable, this is just specific to MySQL. It's... It's not actually a, a Docker command. However, the dash E is going to be to establish an environment variable with a particular value in that container. So we'll go ahead and run this and get this thing moving. And then, of course, it can't find it, so it has to download it and build it. So now that that's done, remember we used dash D, so it started in the background. And then that, that's ready to go. We could check that with Docker container ls. We can see that it's running here. And mole MySQL is going to be its name. So next thing we're going to do is create a Node.js container, and then we're going to run bin bash as the first command. That way we just open a terminal into that container. And again, we're going to specify the proper network. We're going to specify dash IT, that way it's interactive. And then we're going to specify a name called mole node. So we have mole MySQL and mole node. So we'll take this, copy it in here. Just like MySQL, it has to download everything and build it. So now everything's built, and you can see that I have a terminal into the container of the Node.js 8, you know, container. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to do ping mole underscore MySQL. And you can see that I'm getting a response. And that's because, because these two things are using the same network, it's allowing this container, the Node container, to contact the mole MySQL container. If I had the MySQL CLI tool inside the Node.js container, which I don't because Node.js is not related to MySQL, I would be able to connect to the database from here. So in my Node.js application, I could simply just reference mole underscore MySQL, and it makes it really easy to connect to other containers that are part of that same network. Now it's also worth mentioning that unless you specify otherwise, you do automatically have access to anything that's on the internet. So you can contact google.com for instance. So let's just recap what we've done here. So we started by creating a very simple Python container and running a Python file using that container. We then create a second Python container, but from an image that also had NumPy installed to it. And then we executed that same file. We then moved on to serving up a single static HTML file using an Nginx container. And then finally, we demonstrated the power of Docker networks to take two containers and tie them together with the same network. And then we logged into one of the containers, the Node.js container, and we were able to ping the MySQL container successfully, meaning that it's able to contact MySQL no problem. And then from MySQL, it could also contact the Node.js container if it was so inclined to do so. Now keep in mind, in all this software that we've been using, Nginx, Node.js, MySQL, and Redis, Python 3, 
we never actually installed any software to our computer other than Docker. And that's very powerful because that totally removes the need to control versions. You can run Python 2, 2.6, 2.7, Python 3, 3.4, 3.5. So you can run all these in all separate containers without any conflicts. Same with Node.js. If you have a Node.js 4.0, 6.0, 8.0, and 10.0 application, you can run four separate containers that have four separate applications mounted into those containers, and you can run them without any conflicts. And there's Docker images for everything. If you want to check out more, go to hub.docker.com and then just search for whatever, whether it's MySQL or Redis, Node, anything you could possibly want, it's all on there. And if it's not on there, take the thing that is almost what you want and just use a Docker file and just make it exactly what you want. My final thought before we end the video is that there is an easier way to describe different container layouts and how they should work and different options and it's called Docker Compose and I'm going to cover it in a separate video. And you may find that once you learn Docker Compose that's all you're going to want to use and that's that's really all I use but you, understanding Docker Run and Docker Network and Docker Build are all very important to understanding kind of the underlying technology for Docker. Anyway that's it for now see you on the next video.